Greetings, Padawans. Welcome to Jedi Lesson 2. First of all, I wanted to point out something that you probably saw in video 1. What you saw was a little piece of malware injecting itself into my computer. I mean, you've probably seen this before, where you get a fake sort of antivirus application installed and, you know, like Internet Defender 2011 antivirus. It's just nothing more than a series of banners that pop up and annoy you and drive you insane. A program that I want to show you, young Padawa links, is right here. It's called Malwarebytes. This program is very good for getting rid of the sort of uh, internet annoying malware program, spyware. Yes, notice, by the way, the insane amount of programs installed. Never have your start menu like this. Don't do what I do. Keep it, keep it trim. This program right here, Malwarebytes. Um, if you find yourself, you've really got something you can't get rid of. Your Norton isn't getting rid of it. Your AVG isn't getting rid of it. Your Kaspersky isn't getting rid of it. This program here has worked some serious magic. What you want to do is you want to boot your computer up uh, with all your programs turned off. Boot up in a safe mode. Um, if you don't know what that is, don't worry. There will be a lesson that goes over removing spyware in the very near future. Anyway, back on to uh, Jedi Lesson 2, Physical Topology. So physical topology is how is the network laid out in a physical perspective. Alright, the manner in which devices or nodes on a network interconnect with each other. So we're going to go over the, the main ones here. What we have right here is the bus topology. All right, And what defines the bus topology is that all devices on this network share a communication line and this communication line is called a bus alright so they're all connected in a series one after the other and that has some implications alright number one it's the simplest way to connect clients this is actually how uh, ethernet or local networks worked back in the 80s maybe even the early 90s and what you would have is you would have these coax cables the same ones that are used by your cable company and there would be a series of T connectors so it would go into this T connector this T connector and then be a third one branching off into you know your computer your server whatever the case may be all right the second most important thing to remember about this is that both ends must be terminated and the reason is the signal is going back and forth through this entire uh, bus network this backbone it's if this computer wants to send to this computer it's going to go right here, go into him, come out of him, go in, go out, go in, go all the way down and say, aha, you are my destination, you're who I'm trying to send to, and in there. Um, the problem is, that signal doesn't necessarily die with that computer, depending on who sends it and where it goes. When he sends a signal, it doesn't necessarily go just this way, it also goes this way to the other end. So you have to have a resistor here to absorb that signal and prevent it from bouncing back and forth because as you know the signal will just keep bouncing back and forth forever and ever and well not necessarily forever ever. there's of course you know degradation of signal but it'll, it'll basically collide and corrupt signal being sent by other computers at the same time. Um, now as I mentioned it is shared so the possibility of collisions uh, a collision occurs when this guy, this guy, this guy, two or more computers send at the same time and their packets, their information hits the wire at the same time, crashes into each other. And when you got that, you get noise. You get this. Let's find a good image here. This is what you get right here. So that's no good. So it's it's the older form of a physical network, um, as I said, it's the easiest to set up, but it's more prone to collisions because of that. So there, we're not going to cover that in this video, but be aware, because of that concern, there has to be a mechanism to control the timing, to control the access that these devices have on the network. All right, last, because all devices are connected in a series, traffic between two nodes travels through all other devices in between. And you know, that's also a security concern, too. This guy can completely sniff everyone else's traffic on the network because it's all going to pass through him. Um, because of this, also, it's a less uh, robust network. A break anywhere in this bus, in this physical network here, brings everything down. Why? There's no resistors here. A broken cable isn't a resistor. So that's the signal will bounce here, come back, and it will start creating collisions on its way back this way if this is where the break would be. Alright, so older form of network, let's move on and look at something more modern. 
Oh, yes. As I mentioned here, note for future lessons, uh, any systems that have bus network architectures, we're going to discuss that collision handling, that collision avoidance, and it's basically controlling when those devices are allowed to send and receive information. When are they allowed to access the network? So this newest one, uh, or not necessarily the newest, the newer one in the model here is a start topology. And in this one, rather than devices connecting through, God, I can't get this, there we go, centered, perfect. These devices are not connected through T connectors, they're connected through a central device, a hub, a concentrator, a switch. And so because of that, there's a point-to-point -point connection between each unique device and this central hub here. So this is probably one of the more common ones for modern day networks. Um, because devices connect to this hub, a failure of a single device or a single line is not going to affect the rest of these devices. You know, if this guy's cable fails, all of these other devices on the network will continue to operate. Because of this, this also makes it a lot easier to troubleshoot. You know, let's go back up here and look at the bus. All right, if you have a break here, try figuring this out. And imagine this isn't 10 devices. Imagine this is 100. You know, you have 50 devices that are working, 50 devices that aren't, and you have to try to figure out where the break is, and it could be someone nicked the cable. It's uh, not fun. Not fun figuring it out. On this end, if one device fails, it's like, oh, he's the specific port on this guy. I know where the problem is. All right, moving along. The next type of network we're going to discuss is the mesh topology, and there's two types, full and partial. Just know that a mesh topology is defined by redundant connections. Devices have multiple connections to other devices. So the first one we're going to look at is uh, the full mesh, where every device on the network has a connection to every other device. Um, it's not quite as common because, number one, it's more expensive. You need uh, a lot more connections between devices. and Mesh topology is typically not, oh, look at that, it attacked, not something you're typically going to deploy in computers. This picture is somewhat misleading. You're not going to have computers in a mesh topology. You know, each one of these would require a network card or a network port. Typically, this is going to be done with routers. You want to have a backbone network. Los Angeles, New York, San Francisco, Tokyo, um, you know, these need to have redundant connections. And maybe all of the other connections say, well, let's just use Verizon as example. Not the best example, but we'll use them. This might be the LA hub. This might be the Arizona Phoenix hub. The, you know, all these different ones. This might be, I don't know, somewhere maybe Oregon or Washington. And they have redundant connections to each other. Um, looking at here, this tells you exactly how many connections. In is the number of devices on the network. So what you do is you look here. I have, uh, I have five devices. So I need... 5 times n minus 1, 4. 5 times 4 is 20, divided by 2, 10 connections for 5 devices. Guess what? What happens when you have 20 devices? What happens when you have a complex service provider network like AT&T or Verizon where you have hundreds if not thousands of routers? So typically not the most common deployed for that reason. What is more common is a partial mesh. And as the name implies, only a subset of all possible connections are utilized. So it's much more common than a full mesh, and you still gain the benefits of redundancy. Looking here, I don't know if you can quite see it with the video. Um, you've got these black connections, then blue here and red. The blue and the red are showing uh, redundant connections. So branch 2 is connecting to this guy, branch 1 is connecting to this guy, but they also have a redundant connection to this other secondary router right here. So, you know, you again, as I said, you gain the benefits of redundancy if a link goes down your network operates one of the big problems uh, can happen in troubleshooting you don't necessarily know a failure has occurred especially in a full mesh a full mesh uh, right here can you imagine one line fails you might never know that network might continue running it might take some serious diagnostics just to discover that there is a problem here you know it's going to be a little bit more obvious but still but that's the point the point is the network will continue to run despite a single failure so most modern designs are going to incorporate the sort of partial hybrid mesh alright well that is it for our lesson uh, we have a bunch of lessons coming up uh, we're going to explore ethernet we're going to explore wireless I'm going to talk about a little bit about windows and a little bit about spyware so stay tuned you know, try to control your downloading of lesbian hentai. I know it tempts you kids, but in the end, you'll just get spyware like the Jedi did.